Welcome to the cold, clear waters where the big brutes lurk. To massive woods, wetlands, and wide open country where big game trophies, elusive game birds, and all living things reside. Welcome to a world where the exciting challenge of outdoor adventure takes away tensions and the time clock never ticks. Welcome to another educational outdoor video, custom produced by Bay Winkleman Productions, with you in mind. Come along for explosive fishing action and never-to-be-forgotten hunting trips. Whatever the creature, we'll be your teacher. And that's not all. We'll be meeting the gurus of the great outdoors, guides and outfitters, conservationists and tournament pros. So, at least for a while, put everything else aside, sit back, relax, and let the wonders of a wilder world take you wherever you want to be. Crappie. Hey, come on now. I already know that they're one of your favorites, if not your favorite fish to catch. Yes, they can be found in almost every kind of lake, reservoir, river, and farm pond. And yes, they thrash and splash and fight like the dickens. And yes, when it comes to good eating, crappies are awful tough to beat. For me, well, they're all good enough reasons. But hey, to the 19 million anglers who go fishing for crappies each season, it all adds up to the classic American tradition simply that can't be beat. Hi, I'm Babe Winkleman, and thanks for joining me and my friend here on this very special video. Hey, and I do mean special, because this tape is dedicated to all of you who are interested in crappies and the new crappie fishing craze that seems to have been taking the country by storm since Crappies on USA got started. In 1984, its number of participants soared from 30,000 then to over a quarter of a million today. Just think about it. Over a quarter of a million crappie fishermen all involved in the same movement, and I'm proud to say I'm one of them. In fact, my company and I are proud to sponsor this organization, which not only promotes crappie fishing as a sport, but also works to further the future of this amazing fish. In this video, we'll be sharing some important background information, and we'll discuss some dynamite techniques that'll help you solve the crappie fishing puzzles. You can get really good at catching crappies, but only if you learn to put all the different pieces of that puzzle together. Now, you'll find that it won't take long before both the size of your stringers and your enthusiasm for the sport is bound to grow. Okay, now before we go any further, let's talk a little bit about the star of this tape, the crappie. As you may or may not know, there are two types of crappies found in the waters of North America, black and white crappies. Although they have many, many differences, they're also very much alike in some ways. Their diets are both much the same, consisting of small minnows, various stages of insect life, crustaceans and plankton. Black and white crappies spawn about the same water temperature, we're about the same colors, and yes, for the most part, their seasonal movements are similar as well. But as I said, there are also quite a few differences. Black crappies prefer cold, clear water, so they thrive best in lakes and rivers of the north. On the other hand, white crappies can tolerate warmer, murkier water and are abundant in the rivers and reservoirs of the south. Black crappies prefer sand or gravel bottoms for spawning, while the whites can tolerate muddier bottoms and generally spawn in a little deeper water. Both black and white crappies can be found in almost every state of the Union, with the exception of a few of the western states. Now, probably the most noticeable difference between the two is their appearance. Black crappies have dark, irregular blotches on their sides. Whites have five to ten vertical bands of dark blotches on their sides. Also, as you can see, the head of the black crappie is more rounded at the nose than the more pointed head of the white crappie. You see what I mean? They both have the same last name, but their first name is what makes black crappies different from whites. As I always say, nothing in nature just happens, but everything in nature happens just. And this means simply that nature never makes mistakes. We have two arms instead of one, feet with five toes instead of four, and yes, even the hair on my face is there for some specific reason. Now, I'm not saying you crappies grow beards, and fins may have taken the place of toes, but you can learn a lot about catching them by gaining a better understanding of why nature has built crappies the way it has. First, let's take a look at their rather large eyes, which are placed high on the crappie's head. This allows for extremely good forward and upward vision for feeding by sight. What does this say to you about the most logical placement of the baits? The obvious answer is to keep offerings either in front of or above their eyes. Their eyes are also very sensitive to direct light, so they always do their best to avoid it. And for this reason, dusk and dawn, the dark of the night, overcast or windy days when light penetration is lessened, all are likely times to find crappies foraging in shallow water. 
Then again, during periods of intense light, crappies will generally be found in either deeper water, where direct light is also lessened, or near some types of underwater cover which provide shaded areas for them to hide in. So as you can see, in many situations, light conditions play a big role in crappie location. Now, the next feature we should observe more closely is what appears to be a very small mouth. <laughs> this really is a fooler, because in a fraction of a second, a crappie can open his mouth and consume a three-inch minnow like it wasn't even there. <laughs> now listen, one of the most common mistakes fishermen make is underestimating the real size of a crappie's mouth. They use hooks that are simply too small or have too small of a gap on them to get the job done. Using the right size hooks is a must when it comes to fighting crappies who have very soft, paper-like tissue surrounding the edges of the mouth. Now lastly, let's take a closer look at nature's reasons for the crappie's coloration. And you'll see once again, nothing in nature just happens. Look at the high contrast of the crappie's black and silver exterior. In their natural habitat, this not only camouflages them, but experts also feel that these colors allow crappies to quickly identify and keep track of each other as they travel in schools. And I'll bet that's something you didn't know. And although black and white crappies have their colors arranged a bit differently, the colors are basically the same for the same reason. Kind of interesting, huh? Okay, now that you know a bit more about crappies and their habits, the next thing you'll need to understand is how to go about locating them. And this can be a tough task because at various times of the years, crappie can be found in just about any place on any given lake for any number of reasons. During any season, crappies will be looking for the same basic necessities like food, comfort, and cover. So with those things in mind, let's take a look at where crappies go and what they do during the spring months. Now, during the early part of the season, the most important need for crappies are to feed and prepare to spawn. They'll usually be found in shallow, dark bottom bays, boat canals and lakes and reservoirs, or in flooded backwater areas of most rivers. Because these are the first places to warm after the long winter months, these are also the first sites to produce plankton. Not only do crappies feed on these tiny aquatic animals, but so do large schools of minnows. And as a result, crappies have two abundant food sources to choose from rather than one. Once the water temperature reaches the optimum spawning temperature, which is generally between 62 and about 68 degrees, crappies will begin their annual spawning ritual. Usually this takes place over gravelly areas amongst weeds or brush at depths ranging typically from two to about 10 feet. All the while this is going on, feeding is of secondary concern to the crappies. But in spite of that, this is the best time to catch large stringers of big fish. You see, while they're on the beds, not only are they concentrated in small areas, crappies are also extremely protective. Now, the bedding males are aggressive towards baits because they feel their eggs are in danger, not because they're hungry. And that's why fishing for spawning crappies is so productive, but only for those who understand truly what's going on. Now, during the summer months, crappies tend to move to depths ranging from 10 to, say, about 40 feet, and typically around weed beds, rock piles, and sunken points. Not only do these kinds of structure provide security, they're also sites where large schools of minnows occur and where many summer insect hatches take place. At this time of year, look for suspended schools of crappies on your flasher. Occasionally during summer, crappies can also be found over bare bottom flats at about the same depth, feeding on hatches that only take place in these kind of areas. But don't forget, crappies can also be found shallow, especially during those periods when direct light levels are reduced. Okay, now on to fall and winter. We've already said that the warmer waters of spring bring crappies to the shallows to feed, and the same thing holds true in fall as water temperatures begin to drop. At this time of the year, however, the warmest water isn't found in the shallows, it's found in the deeper water as the lakes turn over. As cold water temperatures cool the warmer water on the surface, it sinks to the bottom, trading places with the warmer water on the bottom, which in turn also cools, sinks, and keeps the process kind of going. We call it turnover. And this keeps happening until the water temperatures are pretty much the same from top to bottom. During fall and the early winter months, crappies tend to use the same kind of spots in summer, but especially those that lie in close proximity to the deepest holes in the lakes. These are staging areas where the crappies can feed throughout fall and winter and at the same time begin preparation for spawning. Fall and winter are great times to catch crappies because food is tough to come by in most places of the lake, However, in these staging areas, they hold large concentrations of minnow and insect larvae, and the crappies veritably got a smorgasbord. Now, how deep should you be looking? My bias is to follow the forage. If their dinner weight for them in 50 feet of water, you can bet the crappies will be there as well. The main thing is, be versatile. And now that we've talked about where they live, and why they do some of the things they do at least, let's get into some of the best methods I know of for catching crappies. 
So, what do you say? Let's head out to where every good pattern got its start and get to talking about some really great patterns that can help you catch a lot more fish. Watch this. Oh, boy, this is a good one, too. Out coming the boat. You know, if America's got a favorite fish, boy, this is probably it. Big crappie. And I think America probably does have a favorite fish. That's a nice fish. But you know, when most people go crappie fishing, I'm afraid they go out with a bobber and a hook and, and a minnow or a worm, and they go out and they just kind of find a spot and they anchor there and they sit. And I'm not saying anchoring is bad, and I'm not saying finding a spot is bad. But what you gotta realize is that there's a lot of ways to skin a cat and there's a lot of ways to catch a crappie. There's a lot of places to catch a crappie. I'm gonna assume today that you've got your own places. And every one of us does. There, crappies are every place across America, and every lake has its own hot spots. But most of the time, I'll bet you, when you go to your local hot spot, you do the same thing probably every time. And that's you go out, you anchor in about the same spot, you use about the same bait, and you do it about the same way. And sometimes you catch fish, and then they're biting. And other times you don't catch fish, and then they're not biting. Okay, now this first rig that I've got here, this is my number one, if you will, rig for catching crappies. It's a quiver jig, and a quiver jig, in my opinion, is the best single jig I've ever used for crappies, without question, and I think, well, I've found it's worked everywhere in the country. It's a bullet-shaped jig, a special type of a head, where you notice that the hook eye comes off, so it suspends horizontally in the water, and it's got a floss body on it that just breathes and undulates, it always moves. Then I take a minnow, and in this case, I've got big crappie, so I'm using a big minnow right up to the lips, and I suspend that underneath the bobber. Now this is my number one system for catching crappie usually and for finding crappie. I call it my fish magnet, or crappie magnet if you will. Oh man, I landed up on that reef. I'm trying to get in close by that one reef that school is milling all the way back through here. But a lot of times when I first start, and I'm hunting there, and I'm hunting crappies, okay, I'll start with a quiver jig and the bobber with a minnow on it. Now, depending upon the color of the day that, and the color of the water, I'll vary what color of jig that I start with. Um, for example, I'm starting here with pink and white, but there's several other colors that we use. And I'll show you what I'm talking about here. Okay? For quiver jigs... Oh, wait a second. My bobber's down. Where'd you... Oh, there. Yeah, I get the yakking and... Ooh, boy, it's another good crappie. Oh, he jumped. <laughs> oh, boy. This, that wind is... I positioned my boat, if you notice, right upwind, because a lot of times the crappies will position and feed into the wind. So I positioned and anchored right up here so I can throw right up against that reef. Whoa, oh, boy. Now this is what you call a big black slab crappie. Whew. Boy, I got you right through the bone, too. It's another thing that's very positive about this kind of a jig for crappies. Okay, notice the mouth here. You see how it's shaped? See your ridges around here? See the gristle areas that you've got in here? Okay, you want to have a, a wide enough sprout on that hook so it gets around past this initial gristle area on the lip of the crappie and gets into this real thin area here. Then you'll get a good hook on it. And that's one place. There you go, kid where the quiver jig is really nice. It's got a real wide sprout. See, and you can see it's made just for hooking with live bait. But now let me show you before I, well, take that back. Let me get a minnow on here and cast back out and then I'll show you the colors I was talking about. Because even though I enjoy sharing with you an awful lot about fishing, I don't enjoy it quite as much as I do catching, if you know what I mean. Okay, now if I can get that puppy tucked right up against that reef again. Good. Okay. Now here you go. There's several different colors. First off, a lot of cases contrast is good on colors. All right? And there's a couple colors that I don't use contrast with. But the pink and white is what I've started with here, all right? Here's another color, and this is... 
color is just really particularly deadly, and it's a uh, fluorescent orange in chartreuse back. And boy, in stained water and sometimes in overcast days, that color can be very, very good. Sometimes in overcast days, a straight black like this can be very good. And this one is a black head with a chartreuse, okay? In very muddy water, a lot of times I've found that this uh, fluorescent orange with a black head is good. Very clear water, I'll use straight chartreuse, straight blue and black like you're seeing in blue and black. Boy, that can be a hot one too. And then sometimes straight white. Those are the colors that I'll use of the quiver jigs. Now, there's different sizes of them, obviously. Where's my bobber? Obviously, it's down. Where'd you go? Boy, I got a belly in my... Oh, there he is. I had a belly in my line. Come here. That wind is blowing me just right. Oh, oh, oh. 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 Look at that puppy, huh? Boy, they're just as big as black. These fish are averaging a good pound in here, and a pound is one heck of an average for crappies. Now, I mentioned before, I've got four pound test line on here. This is a little Shimano 2501 rod. It's a five foot long ultralight rod. Very, very, very light tip, see? That's important to you for several reasons. First off, the only way that you can work, I'm gonna let it slide down into that pocket once. The only way that you can properly cast light line is with very light rods and light equipment. Secondly, when you're using little 16th ounce baits like that, the lighter the line, the better, the more looser the swimming action in the water. And boy, that can be critical to you. The difference some days between four pound and six pound line or four pound and eight pound can be dramatic. Now, thirdly, there's some do's and don'ts with how you set a hook and what you do once they bite. Oh, watch this. There he goes. Ooh. Now, you notice I did set a hook on it. Boy, I'll tell you what, now I got a crappie this time. And it's important, a lot of people say, hey, crappies are paper mouse. Come here. Whoa. Get out from around the prop of the boat. And crappies do have paper mouths. I fight them very gingerly. But when you first set that hook, there's a lot of places crappies have bone in their mouth as well. Whoa. Oh, man. Boy, you're a holster. You got a mouth on you like a large mouth bass. <laughs> How's that puppy? Huh? Whew. Big black fella. Let's assume for a second now that, um, that the quiver jig is not doing what you want, okay? And you're not catching crappies on. Let me show you a few other rigs, even though this one is working right now where we're at. This is a different version of it. This is a floating quiver jig. It's got the same floss on the back, but notice, the thing floats by itself. Now, there's sometimes that the crappies are just not very aggressive. They're laying down, hugging by the bottom, say, sometimes after cold fronts. We don't necessarily have that now, although this rig will work right now, okay? Typically, if I'm fishing with kids or fishing with people that are just beginning fishing, it's a lot easier to work with a bobber because they can see the thing go down and see their bite, okay? On this kind of a setup, you can't. You got to feel it. But when the crappies are negative and hugging the bottom, this is going to catch a lot more, usually, than the bobber will. Okay, what is it? Start with the floating quiver jig over here, and I've got the same pink and white on. And there's a snail, and I've got four pound clear line on this snail. Here's a little swivel clip and an eighth ounce lindy rig sinker. What this is, is a lindy floating rig. Or it turns into once you rig it up like so. Now again with the minnow. You hook them up that same way, if you'll notice. Right on up through the lips and watch him in the water. And you'll see he streams right out behind there and he can fight and then that thing holds him off the bottom. Now with this rig, and again, I've got the same kind of a rod, a very light action rod. You lob it out in place. That little walking sinker drops down to the bottom and it pulls the bait right down there. But with the floating quiver jig on the back, 
it allows it to come up maybe a foot off of the bottom and just sit there and work right in front of them. Again, I'll twitch it along. And I'll just feel for it very lightly. So you just tug like this. Just kind of ease it in. I want this thing to swim right over the bottom. The fish are not real aggressive, all right? So you want a slower, uh, more of an enticing type of a presentation. Now, let's look at a third system, or a third type of a bait here for fishing shallow water. And this is a standby and something that I go to fish a lot when the fish are very, very active. And this is a jig spinner. This happens to be a 1 16th ounce orange and white fuzzy grub spin. And see, I've got a little number two Colorado blade on here, and sometimes you want, might even go to a little number one Colorado blade. And again, I like the contrast color on the jig. Now, depending upon how aggressive the fish are, will determine whether you need to tip this with live bait or not, okay? Crappies have good low light vision, and they'll come in when they're aggressive. They can feed by the vibration of the spinner. For example, sometimes, and I'm just going to throw a couple of casts here. I don't know if this is going to work in here or not, to be very frank with you, because these crappies are not super aggressive. We'll just buzz it very slowly under the surface. But when I would use this kind of a bait, okay, and right now would not be the condition, although I'm trying to show you the technique here would be when you get one of those flat, calm evenings where you see the crappies coming up and you see minnows shooting. You know what I mean? You see them going, that's when a little jig spinner like this. You can throw the thing a long distance. It's very quick fishing. In that case, you'll want to skim it right under the surface. Maybe you can watch this thing running right under the surface. When you're dealing with suspended crappies, it gets hard to cast with a bobber. If the fish are down over six feet deep, I mean, yeah, you can go to a longer rod, and the one I use for this technique is a six and a half foot ultralight. It's a 1651, okay? But if the crappies are suspended 10, 15, 20 feet down, and oftentimes throughout the summer months, that's where you find them, this is the slickest way to catch them. Or one of, well, there's never only one way, okay? But this is one darn good one. And it's simple slip bobber rig. Now let me start here. I've got this one rigged on the line, but I haven't tied it up yet. So let me show you what we're dealing with, okay? First off, it's a very tiny plain hook with one simple split shot, and I like to keep it a good six inches up so the minnow has room enough to swim down here, and then the sliding slip bobber. Now with the slip bobber, this one is a Lindy's, and it comes with string tied right around the end of the thing. You first thread it onto here, all right? Once you get it threaded on, then you take this first spool of line here and you slide it right off at the end of the bobber, just like I'm showing you. If I can get this sucker off the end of the bobber. Okay, there we are. We get it up onto the line. Now you take the tag ends. You see how I'm doing that? Take these tag ends and you pull them evenly. So what it does is form a certain kind of a knot. Then I like to clinch it like so with my teeth. Okay, now you take, like so, and you clip these tag ends right next to the knot. You don't want any raggy ends coming off of there. You want it just as... Okay. There you got it. Now, take a close look here, and you can see against my thumb just what you've got. This tiny little knot of line that when I grab it like so, I can slide it up and down the line. Now what it does, it serves as a bobber stop. You see how the bobber comes up to it right here and it hits against that knot and it stops it. In other words, if I set the knot at three feet deep, the bobber when I'm casting will slide all the way down right to here. It'll slide until it hits the slip shot. That's how far it'll go down. So if I'm making a cast, all right, you see how it's rigged up here. I mean, the bobber's right down there. I can bring it up here, reel the knot right in through the line guides, just like so, and make a cast easy, okay? Even though my bobber's set, for example, say I want to be fishing 15 feet down, I can still cast it this easy, and that's critical. With any other kind of a rig, you couldn't do it. You simply cast it out, and here is where I like this long rod for big lob casts. Oh, there we go. Oof. Yeah, I just set this lip bobber for a couple of feet, so it's at the same depth that I was fishing the other ones here. Ooh, another nice crappie. A little bit of jump out of you. Oh! 
Big guy. And another facet I want to talk to you about. You know if I, I've released all these crappies today? Yes, they're prolific fish. Yes, they're delicious to eat. But I'll tell you, they're not indispensable. We can fish them out. We can fish down populations. If you're looking for crappies, take home a few to eat. That's great. But the stomp freezers is ridiculous. I mean, just they're always better fresh. And if we continue to release, particularly the bigger crappies like that, they've also got an opportunity to genetically crossbreed and continue to produce a lot of big crappies for us. Hey, I've covered a few things this afternoon that I hope will help you improve your crappie fishing. Now, that's not all the techniques by any means, but what it is is four surefire bait systems that I promise you, if you use them right in the right places, I guarantee you'll catch more crappie. Oh, you're back already. You kind of snuck up on me there. Anyway, I sure hope you picked up a couple of tips that'll help you, because as much as I hate to say it, every one of us will need all the help we can get, that is, if we want to compete someday in one of the many upcoming crappie-thon events. And here's the main tip I know will help. Keep on studying. As the sole sponsor of educational products for Crappiethon, it's my goal to provide the public with as much good, solid information on crappie fishing, and this video is only one example of the things we have to offer. Whatever the angling challenge, we'll do our best to help you, and that's exactly why Teaching America to Fish has been my company's slogan from the beginning. And remember, if you do compete in a Crappiethon tournament, and if you catch Big Bad Babe there, I'm going to pay you $1,000. And if you're wearing both my sunglasses and my Angler's Edge Toolkit, I'll pay you another $5,000 just for fun. Oh boy, just think about that. Not only do you get some fantastic products that'll make your fishing more fun, but you'll have a chance to empty my bank account at the same time. <laughs> Nobody better tell Charlie about that. Seriously. I'll be back in just a minute, but in the meanwhile, let's take a little closer look at just a few of the other educational products that we here at Babe Winkleman Productions are proud to offer you. Feel the excitement. It's the action-packed, information-filled world of Babe Winkleman, Hall of Fame angler and America's foremost fishing educator. Be a part of it with Babe's entertaining educational books and videos and quality research team products and accessories. The Secret's Out, Babe's Fishing Secrets Educational Video Library is the hottest collection of fishing videos ever produced. Choose from 27 exciting Fishing Secrets titles, including 12 brand new releases this year. Getting any lately? Now you can learn to master the patterns of nature with expert tips from some of the most respected outdoorsmen in the world. Babe Winkleman Productions is proud to present this dynamic new collection of in-depth how-to hunting and fishing videos. If you're a serious sportsman, you'll want to check them out. See what you've been missing with Babe's Fisherman's Favorite Polarized Sunglasses. Available in gray or amber, large, medium, and clip-on styles. They're the finest fishing sunglasses money can buy. It's every tool a fisherman needs, right at your fingertips. Babe's Angler's Edge Toolkit is actually 10 fishing tools in all, including this unique 5-in-1 pliers that easily removes paint from jig eyes, just like that. They're the best guides on the water. Babe's critically acclaimed comprehensive guidebooks are must-reading for beginners and pro anglers alike. Considered the Bible of modern fishing technique, these volumes are guaranteed to make you a better fisherman. Don't miss the boat. Look for Babe's tapes, books, and research team products at leading tackle, sporting goods, video, and department stores everywhere. And feel the excitement in the action-packed world of Babe Winkleman Productions. Hey, thanks again for joining me and my friend here on this special tape on understanding crappie. And I want to wish all of you all the luck in the world as you go fishing for crappies or any other thing for that matter. But while you're out there, keep in mind that fishing is a privilege and not a right that we have. In order to ensure its future, we all have to keep working together and paving the way for good conservation practices. Together, we can learn to master the patterns of nature and learn how to cooperate with nature, and that way we all win. So, until next time, hey, good fishing.